I had just entered the fifth grade when I encountered a big idea about change. On the first day of school, I walked into class and noticed a laminated sign hanging above the dry erase board. And that sign said this, change is the only constant. Now, I'm not sure why Miss Clark placed this quote front and center, but I do remember exactly how I felt when I read this sign. Because if there's one way to describe me as a kid and to describe me even now, it would be this, change a verse. I'm not just talking about big changes like changing schools, a fracture in the family, or moving to a new state. No, I'm talking about all change. Like when a network changes the day and time of my favorite television program. All types of change make me uncomfortable. Something about change has always been difficult for me. My difficulty with change probably revolves around this idea. When things change, things will never be the same. Maybe you can relate to that idea. Maybe you aren't quite as habitual as I am. Maybe, just hypothetically here, you didn't experience an emotional meltdown when, say, your family had to replace their minivan of 10 years. But even if you're more emotionally healthy than me, chances are you've been upset with some kind of change. Maybe you're upset with how the world has changed, and it seems like there's no chance it will ever be like it was. Maybe growing up you learned a certain set of beliefs from your parents, but as you've grown older, you've struggled with those specific beliefs. Things have changed permanently. Or maybe a relationship has changed. Even if it wasn't a breakup or an abrupt end to a friendship, it's just a relationship that's somehow different. That's still a change. You shared life with this person and then things changed, maybe even forever. Or maybe it was some other significant life change, a job, a move, a different roommate, a new baby, something outside of your control happened, good or bad, and life as you knew it, it suddenly became different. It just wasn't the same. This is important to know. Even good change can be difficult. You may receive a promotion at work only to find yourself on a new team, which is bittersweet. You may welcome a new baby into your home, which is a joyous occasion. But this change also means that life no longer operates with the same sort of freedom you once experienced. Or maybe you had a child leave home to attend college. You waited years for this moment, yet it feels more bitter than sweet. All good things, but difficult nonetheless. Change can be hard because it disrupts the usual. It upsets what felt normal. It seems that, as humans, we're wired to look for and take the path of least resistance. And what offers least resistance than the status quo? What could be more easier, more comforting than sticking to what you've always known? That's why, when we're confronted with change, whatever that change may be, we tend to immediately ask this question. How do I get things back to normal? How do I make things comfortable again? When we ask this question, we really have one primary goal. We want to manage the change externally, the circumstances, the relationship, the job, the move, so we can feel more comfortable internally. In other words, we ask ourselves, what do I need to do to feel as comfortable as possible as soon as possible? What do I need to manage outside of myself to make what's happening inside feel manageable? But what if we're asking the wrong question here? Could change be about something more than just dealing with what's happening outside of us? If it's something more, what is it? How do we face it? What does that look like? Now, if anyone was the opposite of being averse to change, it was Jesus. In fact, he seemed to be continually shaking things up. This tendency was one of the main reasons he attracted both enemies and friends. When we read the Gospels, which are the four accounts of Jesus' life, we see that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, continually pushed back on Jesus and his teachings. When we see people in the Bible opposing Jesus, it's easy for us to categorize these people as the bad guys. But we need to remember this, that we're reading these accounts with the benefit of hindsight. We're seeing these events more than 2,000 years after they occurred. 
but imagine being one of these leaders at that time. Imagine you participated in a religious system that had existed for thousands of years. If you were one of those people back then, would you have seen Jesus as the bad guy and the religious leaders as the good guys? Had we lived during that time, I wonder if we would have bristled at what Jesus had to say, if we would have gotten defensive at his then radical teachings. I wonder because Jesus wasn't giving easy messages about staying nice and comfortable. No, when it came to their approach to God, Jesus wasn't suggesting revisions. He was offering revolution, a major upheaval to the way things had always been. Like we know too well, when we're face to face with change on this scale, few of us really welcome it. Jesus incorporated many of his then radical themes into one of his most famous messages, the Sermon on the Mount, which took place by the Sea of Galilee. Jesus began his message by reinforcing the value and significance of the Jewish law. And at this point, most of the audience was on board. But then Jesus went off script and said this, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, at this moment, people's ears would have been perked up because Jesus was quoting one of the Ten Commandments, the law handed down from God himself to Moses. These commandments were absolutely central to ancient Judaism. Yet here was a teacher without any real credentials suggesting that he had a different way to fulfill this unchanging law. To suggest a different take or a different way to fulfill a commandment was beyond uncomfortable. This would have been considered blasphemous. It would be a crime to suggest that you had a better idea than what Moses received directly from God. But that's exactly what Jesus did. So let's see how he finished this statement. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. In one statement, Jesus shifted the nature of this law from an act to an intention. He claimed that the spirit of this law wasn't about behavior, it was about the heart. Talk about radical, talk about change. He didn't stop there though. Next, Jesus talked about adultery and divorce and making oaths and getting revenge. And each and every time he addressed these laws, he started by saying, you have heard it said, and then said, but I say. Over and over again, Jesus took a law that would have been so familiar and comfortable and predictable to people and turned it up quite a few notches. He was saying something new. He was saying something different. He was saying something that required change. Even though the subjects he talked about were totally different from one another, there was a common thread through each of them. Everything Jesus quoted from scripture revolved around our behavior on the outside. But Jesus stated that something else mattered even more, the part of us that people can't see, our hearts. Now, it isn't that all of a sudden God started caring about people's hearts. Throughout the Old Testament, prophets had been sharing this message with God's people. God didn't care about their sacrifices. He cared about their hearts. But that message continued getting lost. And for the people in charge of the religious institutions, it was much easier to monitor outward behavior than it was to monitor internal motives. So even though Jesus wasn't sharing a new concept, it represented a change for how people measured their connection to God. Jesus was shaking things up. He was looking for change. He didn't shy away from it. And he knew that initiating change was painful for all of us but the discomfort of change wasn't enough to keep him quiet. He challenged the comfortable for the sake of something better. Jesus was calling for change where it mattered most, on the inside of people. Thousands of years later, is it possible that Jesus is looking at us and saying, you have heard it said, but I say this about something in our lives? In other words, 
Is Jesus saying, you have been trying to deal with this change on the outside, but I am saying something might need to change on the inside. I don't want you to just manage what's happening on the outside. I want you to look at your heart, look at your motives, look at the thing inside of you that is resisting and ask yourself, what in me needs to change? Change on the outside is an invitation to reflect on the inside. What might happen if instead of resisting change, we asked what we could learn from it? How could it make us better? Instead of trying to rearrange our external lives to make us comfortable as quickly as possible, what if we asked if there was more work to be done inside of us? That there was an invitation to something better? And listen, only you know what that thing might be that needs to change. So this week, let's challenge ourselves to be reflective, to look on the inside, because the change Jesus is concerned with is what's happening in us. What if this week we took time to look inside and ask ourselves the question, what about me needs to change? Where in my life do I need to invite change? Maybe a job change on the outside has revealed an insecurity on the inside. Maybe a change in how you see the world on the outside has revealed a loneliness on the inside. Maybe a change in a relationship on the outside has revealed a fear on the inside. Maybe tension with a family member on the outside has revealed a hurt on the inside. Whatever it is, what if this week, instead of only focusing on the change visible to the rest of the world, you paid attention to what the change is showing you about yourself on the inside? What if you realized there was more to change than just what the world could see? Sometime this week, take five, 10 minutes, longer if you can, and get quiet. Think through the different areas of your life where change has been unsettling. Ask yourself, what is this change showing me about myself? Where do I need to do something new for the sake of my growth and my health and my faith? What does a change on the inside look like for me? When life starts to get uncomfortable, what will I do to go after the internal change that Jesus is inviting me to? Jesus brought change that made people uncomfortable because it wasn't just a change on the outside, it was a change on the inside. It made people squirm. It didn't always sit well, but it was an invitation to go deeper, to look inside, and to live better lives as a result. It didn't happen by accident. It happens when we decide to embrace the change before us and believe there's something better for us. So, as we head into Easter, consider this question. How does a change outside of me show me what needs to change inside of me?